of Vladimir Bobkov from UFA Federal Resource Center. Yeah. So the title is on the screen. Please. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, I have to say that uh, it's a big pleasure to participate in this conference and giving a talk here is a big honor for me. So, and I would like to thank the organizers of this beautiful event. So thank you very much. And uh, my talk will be based on the joint paper with, uh, with Pavel Drabik and Yevdat Eliasov, who is here, and which was published a couple of years ago. And um, I have some renewed interest in this direction. And uh, I will also mention and some, something from our ongoing project with Mia Kotanaka. So uh, let us start with the following. A model and actually maybe simply looking problem for the Pilaplasian. So here it is a Pilaplasian as usual, and uh, we subtract lambda times like this term, which is u in the total power p minus one. So it has the same homogeneity as the Pilaplasian, and <coughs> uh, we equate it to f and consider this equation of a domain bound domain omega in Rn and impose the Dirichlet boundary conditions. So um, uh, we assume that uh, omega is about the domain of class C11. Maybe it can be a bit relaxed, but certainly it's sufficient and relaxed, not much. If it can be relaxed, and not much. And concerning the right-hand side, so at the moment, let us say that it is rather good. So it belongs to some uh, Lebesgue space with good R, and I will describe it later what R we need. So our main aim is to discuss some qualitative properties of solutions. So therefore, let me briefly say about the existence of solutions to that problem, just a few words. And uh, well, in the linear case, we have just a Laplacian and the existence theory for that problem in the linear case is completely described by the like, classical Fred Holm alternative, which basically says that if lambda is not an eigenvalue, then the problem admits a solution, and the solution is unique. While if lambda is an eigenvalue, then the existence uh, can be guaranteed only if uh, f is orthogonal to the eigenspace of the eigenvalue lambda. And of course, in that case, in the case of existence, there is no uniqueness because we can add any eigenfunction that we would generate a continuum of solutions. Well, in the nonlinear case, the story is say, much more different and much more difficult than in the linear case. And I will mention just a very few results of that. So for instance, if lambda again is not an eigenvalue, then weak solution again exists. It can be shown by some Lincoln methods, maybe some others, but uh, uniqueness already lost in general. So for instance, there are cases when uh, one can find at least three solutions depending on f, so maybe, maybe more. And uh, well, if lambda is an eigenvalue, then just the story is even harder because we don't have the Palismel condition, so loss of compactness and no natural orthogonality, so the business becomes more involved. And that topic, like a generalization of the platform alternative to the nonlinear case was developed uh, quite intensively about 10 or 20 years ago, and at least Several authors who contribute intensively to that field, but still there are a lot of open problems. Nevertheless, in the cases we want, the solutions exist. So let's uh, try to discuss some qualitative properties of the solutions. And for that, uh, the first eigenvalue of the P-Laplacian will be important for us. So we know the first eigenvalue of the P-Laplacian is lambda one, and uh, the corresponding first eigenfunction Whichever normalization you have, it's uh, material for us. Uh, we denote as phi one. The only assumption, just for simplicity, that phi one is strictly positive. So it, it, and it's really strictly positive. Also, it satisfies the boundary point lemma. Well, assume that f is non-negative, and of course not identically zero. Yeah. So, what can we say about the signs of solutions? And uh, the following. Information is more or less very well known. It's a maximum principle, which says the following. So if lambda is below lambda one, then any solution to our problem is strictly positive and it satisfies the boundary point lemma. For instance, okay, in particular here, we need some regularity of the domain, but yeah, it would be important. 
And of course, in the linear case, this is, uh, I don't know, it's a very, very classical topic. And in the nonlinear case, I refer to, say, to Vasquez and uh, for further references to put answer in book. Very good. Let me complement this maximum principle by two other like, brief facts. The first of all, if a lambda is equal to the first eigenvalue, then there are no solutions at all uh, yeah, under this assumption, of course. So this is imposed all the time. Uh, also, it can be proved with some work that can be proved that if lambda is sufficiently larger than lambda one, then, uh, then any solution has some zero point inside the domain. But maybe there are some dead cores, or maybe it is sign changing, but certainly the strong versions of the maximum principle are not there. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, the latter two facts can be found, at least uh, like in partial forms, in these two papers. Well, looking at these three cases, so lambda smaller equals or sufficiently greater than lambda one, the only one uh, option for lambda remains. And then uh, this is the case when lambda exceeds lambda one. But not too far away from lambda one. And what happens in this case? And it's interesting enough, at least for me, that in this case, something completely opposite to the maximum principle happens. Namely, uh, there exists some lambda f, yeah, we do not like that, such that if we are in between lambda f and lambda one and lambda f, then any solution is strictly negative already in the domain. And also satisfies the boundary point lemma just outwards. So the outward derivative looks up. Uh, well, so this fact is called the anti maximum principle. At least it was called, uh, and it is an anti maximum principle, and it was first observed in the paper by Clement and Pelletier in the linear case P equals to two, and under this assumption on the right hand side of the source function. So F belongs to LR with R greater than the dimension of the space. And moreover, the Kromen and Pelletier, they consider not just this simple model problem, but a um, very general class of problems with different boundary conditions uh, for the general work. In the nonlinear case, at least for general uh, P greater than one, under this assumption, F is bounded. The anti-maximum principle was proved by Flekinger, Gazette, Starkov, and Etalan some years later. And uh, well, let me say that the approaches in these two works are completely different. And uh, after these two works, this story was developed, so generalized to some other cases, some other problems, some properties were studied. And I mentioned just a say, short list of authors who, who contributed that field. And I apologize if I didn't mention somebody's uh, contributions. There was physical limitations to list everybody. But what is interesting to mention is that if you consider any, at least like up to my knowledge, if you will consider any uh, paper where the anti-maximum principle is studied for the peel Laplacian, then you all the time will meet this regularity requirement of F, which looked quite frustrating to me because, well, in the linear case, we need considerably less regularity on F. So here's our infinity, here's our LR. And this was basically our um, starting point with the joint work with Mieko, Tanaka. And in fact, we were able to prove that the same version of the anti-maximum principle remains valid for any P greater than one and under the same assumption as in the linear case. Why? I'll try to briefly explain on the second slide. Um, so the general idea behind the anti-maximum principle is in some sense rather simple, and it can be formulated in a couple of words. It's just a stability of phi one in this topology. Or in other words, that phi one lies in the interior of the positive corner of that space. So more precisely, uh, the regularity assumptions on F and omega, which we discussed, are actually imposed to guarantee that any solution belongs to that space so the gradient is held up to the boundary and in the linear case that is uh, like very well known that this r greater than n is sufficient to guarantee that the sublet space is embedded here and like this, the problem is resolved in that space so the solutions are here so and i am sure that this result can be extracted from a book uh, but 
I refer to Gilbert and Pritzinger because they have a very explicit theorem about that case, only because of that. Well, if P, well, yeah, so if P is greater than one and F is bounded, then the same resolvability in that space follows from the re results of Lieberman. So very well known paper as well. And actually what uh, appears, or at least it was interesting to me, that in the case P greater than one, and under the same assumption as in the linear case, the problem is again resolvable in that space, and in very particular, this explicitly stated in Pereira and Jean's paper, which is not probably widely known. And what we did with Mieko Tanaka is that we uh, provided more refined a version of that result by um, finding uh, estimates on norms in that space in terms of the right hand side, which is necessary to the proof of the anti maximum principle. I let me say that to the experts in the regularity theory, that fact is probably not surprising at all. So, but I'm not an expert in the regularity theory, so it was interesting to me. Yeah. Good. And what what what's next? And next, the story is the following. So, let us just take any sequence of lambdas which converge to lambda one from, from the left, and consider the sequence of normalized solutions like U n over the L infinity norm of U n, and it can be shown that say by Ascoli Alcala, but there are some additional steps that this sequence converges in this space to the minus P1 properly normalized, minus first eigenfunction. And since the minus first eigenfunction is strictly negative, and of course it satisfies the boundary point lemma, then because we, are, we converge in that space, the same inequalities must be satisfied by your M with any sufficiently large M. And that is the story, basically. And uh, well, one can ask, what uh, can, can we relax the assumptions on F and or on omega, the uh, regularity assumptions? Oh, uh, actually, it seems to be not. Uh, for instance, it was shown by Swears that there exists F in the space Ln for which the anti-maximum principle is violated. So that assumption R, R greater than um, M is optimal in that, at least in the scale of the back spaces. And uh, concerning the boundary regularity, so Berendelli proved that the anti maximum principle is violated already when omega is a square and f is just an identically constant. So that in, at corners of the square, basically the function will change signs. So it is the uh, contradiction to the uh, uh, maximum principle. Well, so very good. Let me say a few words. Um, about the following. So the anti-maximum principle exists. So what is the next step? Next step for me is to investigate the properties of the interval of validity of the amount of this anti-maximum principle. So more precisely, it uh, falls down to the investigation of properties of lambda f. So how this lambda f depends on f? And up to now, it's still not entirely known. It's still not entirely clear. So let me say just the, probably the only major thing which is known is that lambda f does depend on f, and it cannot be bounded uh, from below uh, uniformly with respect to f. Mm. Say, and this is a result by Arias Campos Gazes, for instance, here yeah, that it was known before. Uh, well, for instance, and the, do we have some bounds for lambda f in terms of f? So lower bounds, upper bounds. And to the best of our knowledge, the only low bound which exists in the literature is that one which, well, which uh, probably I will skip, I will not describe, but let me say that it is nice bound, but it is a bit unexplicit because the constant f is not quantified and also it depends on the <clears throat> upper bound which is assumed to exist somehow. So it's not uh, so, how to say, at least for our aims, it's not entirely fine, but still it provides some new information. And okay, I will skip one slide. If I will have time, I will return to that, but um, it was about moment problem. And so, up to our knowledge, again, we were not aware of any uh, upper bound for lambda f. And our main aim was to provide some. And so the upper bound, which we found, will be played by this uh, critical value relational type. So lambda f star, which we define as the infimum of that relay quotient, 
with an additional constraint that f should be orthogonal to u. Yeah. And may the result of us sound as follows. So, first of all, okay, so f star belongs to the interval one to one, one to two. That's not a trouble, it's simple. But more uh, important is that if lambda f star strictly smaller than lambda two, then the f lambda f star also bounds lambda f. So it's really the upper bound for the spectral interval of validity of the anti maximum principle. Well, and if lambda f star is equal to lambda two, then we can provide the same, okay, like less or equal inequality, but also bound only under the assumption p equals to two or n equals to one. And so from these two facts, so the only remaining, only the case which remains open up to now, we don't know what's the answer, is that whether the estimate holds true if these three assumptions are simultaneously satisfied. So lambda f star is equal to lambda two, p is not two, and the dimension is greater than or equal to two. And the difficulty here is that actually we, what is the difficult to prove in that case, this inequality, is that we don't have a sufficient information on the eigenspace of the second eigenvalue of the p Laplace, even in the ball, so like that. Well, and here we, uh, in the paper, we provide several sufficient assumptions which guarantee that this inequality is satisfied like, to make the whole result meaningful. Well, I think uh, I have very, very couple of things here, perhaps. Am I right? One minute. Okay. The last minute, so let me then say the where this lambda came from, like why this uh, critical value, why not other? And actually, the intuition here is the following. So it, this value appeared from the investigation of the branch of ground state solutions to our initial problem. So our problem is a variational type, there exists a corresponding energy functional, and the ground states are the least levels of this energy functional. And so the story is that if we are a little bit uh, on the left and lambda one, then the energy is strictly positive, and then it decays, decays, decays. And under the assumption that lambda f star is smaller than lambda two, we know that this branch of ground states intersects the zero level, and it intersects the zero level exactly at the point lambda f star. And any minimizer of lambda f star is a ground state solution of our problem with a zero energy level, and moreover, the any minimizer is sign changing, so it doesn't satisfy the anti maximum principle. Why the sign changing? Because of that constraint. Like not straightforwardly, but it, but it can be shown. We certainly we know that uh, it's say not strictly negative because uh, f is not negative, and uh, to equate that integral to zero, you must have either a zero sets or it has to be sign changing. And basically, this is a story. It can be shown that it is sign changing. And uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention. This when uh, the uh, f is not uh, uniform with respect to f. Yes, right. Uh, can you provide some wide enough class of function for which it would be uniform and ex 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 express this in more, more or less explicit terms? Uh, yeah, thank you. So this is a model problem. So this is about how less is known about this anti-maximum principle, about the properties of lambda f. So that to provide some class for which like it is uniformly bounded, it it's a good problem, actually. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's maybe for future investigation. Yes, thank you. Other questions? So, please. Uh, yeah. 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 Just to clarify, um, uh, what... Uh, uh, what are eigenvalues of Laplace? Are they critical values or or something else? Uh, eigenvalues. Yes, yes, it's just a critical values. Uh, right. Uh, you mean of, uh, of what? Of the Rolle equation? Or yes, 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 of course, of course, yes. Just by definition, right. So lambda one is well defined, lambda two as well, but no properties are essentially known. For lambda two. Okay. Yeah. And uh, one comment. So this value lambda f is homogeneous with respect to f. Uh, Am I right? 
uh, let's check, let's check so lambda f you mean uh, in the interval of validity of, like in the anti-maximum principle yeah yes yes so what where it is sorry more where uh-huh it's here you I mean but if here. we multiply the right hand side by positive constant uh -huh. this value yes. doesn't change i think you so. not change yeah yes. i think so i think so, so it cannot be you actually uh, continuous with respect to L because it is homogeneous of zero order. Uh -huh, right. So it is not uh, continuously dependent on F. Uh, so yes. well, well, in some classes, I would say of F is certainly continuously dependent. Maybe maybe not all, but mm -hmm. not in all. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is certainly some continuous uh, dependent continuous dependence. Maybe on some sphere. Yeah, for instance, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh -huh. so, yeah. Maybe other questions. No. If no, yep. so let us thank, thank you. Thank you.